The Sword of Telamon by Murray Island Jr. Faint sounds seemed to mingle with the breeze as they came first as distant whispers and then in wave-like gusts, now louder or softer, resounding along the valley walls and over the hilltops, carrying both pleasant reminders of spring-awakened splendor and a sense of unease. Suddenly the day's stillness dissolves into disarray as the restful rippling of the clear mountain stream now found counterpoint in the echoes of a great bronze bell erupting in a voice of gentleness and power. A sense of alarm arose and faint cries of assembly carried from the valley where men ran to join the commotion around the king's great tent. Orfeo had been sitting on a flat rock overlooking the encampment when he recognized that something had gone wrong. Raising himself more in disbelief than concern, as though his response on the meadow and the bleeding of his small goat flock made mockery of the frantic shouts below, he fastened his sandals and bounded from stone to stone toward the path and then raced in long loping strides down the hill. The goats could look after themselves until he found them later. When King Hero summoned his people, neither kinsmen nor retainers delayed, and now the mounting noise from below gave further spur for haste. As he entered the encampment, Orfeo heard first the clatter of swords in preparation for use before isolating words gave him a glimpse of what had happened. A raid, he heard, he repeated. Someone must have seen danger approaching, and the image brought with it a vision of the Hane from the north galloping on their small, swift horses, bringing fire and pillage in their wake. Once, as a boy, Orfeo had cowered in a thicket of juniper, as the swordsman had stood and ground against invaders, and had finally driven them off. Now he was ready to stand with the others, still a boy, perhaps, at sixteen summers, but able to wield the sword and hold his place in the line. He ran toward his father's tent, dodging nimbly among the assembling warriors. The bell now sounded at close quarters and sent a chill of excitement through the crowd. Standing on his platform before the great tent stood the king with raised arms. Three armed men had pushed before him with weary movements as if they had run a greater distance than the others and had already encountered the enemy. What do you bring? asked the king. You were late, gasped the leader. Tyron, falling to his knees in shame and frustration. They reached the ship before us and sailed. He was trying to catch his breath. They jeered at us as we reached the shore. He held his weapon's hilt in smoldering rage. Then they are captives, said the king, as if the admission robbed him of all inner peace. My oldest sons, Heron, and three companions were attacked today and seized by raiders. Those in the crowd who had not already heard the news reacted both with shame and anger. It was a slave ship of Tyrian merchants, added Tyron. They landed several raiding parties, and they took captives among the men of Achaea to the south. Heron must be returned, said the king, with a voice more focused upon a course of action. We must rescue or ransom my son from the slavers. The assembled men shouted as a chorus in anger, no less profound than their kings. While Orfeo stood in stunned silence as a new reality descended precipitously upon him, his brother had been taken by raiders, and his father stood before the people and proclaimed that they must recover him. There was talk of a council, and after the king retired to his tent, messengers emerged at intervals to summon those who dwelt on the outskirts of the kingdom. Orfeo wandered with conflicting thoughts to the tent he shared with his cousins, looking with confusion at his sword hanging on one of the outer poles. There would be no immediate need for it, as the raiders were gone, and there would be a long preparation for any action they would take to recover Heron. His cousins were still about the camp, speaking angrily of the outrage, and apparently not immediately mindful that the king also had a second son, nearly ten years younger than the first. 
Yet Orfeo would likely be sought neither for aid nor counsel. He was still not to become a son again in his father's household, and the tribe looked upon him as curiously changed from his long sojourn in the kingdom of Pelos. How strange it seemed for Heron, the brave and valorous warrior, to be sharing the same fate that the child hostage had once endured. Orfeo stood silently just within the shadow of the tent, and then, as if awakening from a frightful reverie, he bounded again toward the mountain, intent upon recovering his goats and finishing their feeding. There was little chance that he would be missed. Still, Orfeo thought, as he climbed the trail, of the great walled city of Pelos and how his life there had been one of both luxury and challenge. He remembered the warships of that city lined up in the Bay of Megara, and the warriors of Pelos had been arrayed against the small tribe of Kiros, who as king had led his people in defense of their homeland. It was another spring day much like this one, only it seemed part of the distant past. Nearly ten years ago, the captain of the ship of Pelos, Osric, had made his offer, and the king had retired to his tent and pondered. There was talk about peace and an alliance and hostages. Orfeo still dimly remembered the words, although at the time he did not understand. He was brought before his father and told that he would be taken to Pelos by the invading army, and that because of his arrangement there would be no battle and no dead men in the camp. He was told that he would represent the Achaeans in Pelos, and that his role was important as a guarantee of peace. But there was more to the story that he could see in his mother's eyes. She smiled through a veil of tears, and she seemed to tremble as she embraced him. Was he five summers or six at the time? He did not know his age for certain until he was in Pelos, and there began to think in such terms as time and place and circumstance. It was a new world, and he had loved much of it, but it had never seemed like home. He had learned to read and write the strange script of the priests and the stiff square signs of the traders. He had been personal servant and companion to Nestor, son of the king of Pelos, who was two years older and just large enough to win everything involving physical strength. Besides, Orfeo was the servant, and he was expected to be neither brave nor clever had not his own people surrendered him as hostage and abandoned him to his fates. Orfeo reached the place where he had left his flock, and to his relief found they had strayed little from the patch of rich greenery. Here, in the solitude of the mountainside, the rush of commotion of the camp seemed an intrusion, and he sat back on the same rock from which he had been aroused, amused at himself, for having run all the way back up the path. Indeed, there was no reason for him to hurry, as his goats had virtually no other place to go, and slave traders were no threat to them. The sun seemed to make the camp below dance in a magical way of accompanied uh, of flashes. Even now swords were catching the light with the shining blades and accompanied the clamor of armor, in signaling the outrage that had been committed against the tribe. Yet, in a curious way, Orfeo felt less concerned than the others. This rested on the idea that to him, captivity in Pelos, where Heron would likely be sold in the slave market, was neither strange nor terrifying, and perhaps, as some of the people in the camp had said, Orfeo had become too much a boy of Pelos in his absence. It had been eight or nine years before his escape, and even now he did not know just why he had claimed, climbed the unguarded wall of the villa, and then slipped through the city gate at dusk. Before his fifteenth year, Orfeo had again managed to find his people, although at first his only guide was a vague knowledge of the direction in which he was to travel. He had been taken aboard a merchant ship as a seaman, and he had sailed back and forth past his homeland several times before he had been able to determine that the king of Kiros, the Achaean, had within the country some men called Mania and others Grecia. By the time he reached home, he was nearly sixteen, and then he came as a stranger 
only dimly remembering a past he had sought with a determination that was neither reasoning nor resistible. Orfeo, second son of Kiros, king of the wandering Achaean peoples, had come home and he stood like an enemy in the camp. His mother looked without words and then wept. While the council seemed distressed and talked of reprisals from Pelos, King Kiros had finally welcomed him home. But there was a reserve, a guardedness, that left no room for a son who was not known to them and who was not heir to the throne. Life had then slowly settled into an existence of moving from camp to camp in the summer and then remaining in the villages around Delphi in the winter. He had at first lived in Kiros's tent, but things were not comfortable with Heron, who appeared to resent more than welcome the return of someone long forgotten. It was as if Orfeo stood as a symbol of a shameful day. All of them would have preferred, preferred to forget and gradually he had come to understand how difficult this banishment had been for both his mother and father. They had grieved long and bitterly over the fate that had taken his son, but it had been their duty to preserve their, fail, their frail nation from a force that could, could have overcome all their defenses. The armies of Pelos had not been on Achaean shores since that time, but they still were feared and respected on all sides of the great sea. Orfeo knew only too well how futile any resistance would have been, and yet his stay in Pelos had taught him something about life and living. Again the clamor from below brought Orfeo from his reveries, and he realized that the sun was beginning its descent, and soon he must return the animals to camp. It was always with regret that he walked down the path at the end of the day as he enjoyed the solitude, and there were so many more complications below. It was more confused now as to how he should be treated. He was, after all, a king's son, yet he chose not to live as a prince in a king's tent, but to dwell with cousins who owned goats and to speed the days away from the interaction of the community. This young Orfeo was a strange one, and perhaps he should not be completely trusted. A mysterious air lingered about him, almost bewitching. He had a way with words and with song. Perhaps it was something he had learned in Pelos, although his masters there had thought it to flow from his background under the skies. Orfeo was both a poet and a minstrel, and it was said he could charm animals from the trees with his pipes and his soft, caressing voice. We've been looking for you. On the trail, Orfeo met his older cousin, Euros, who seemed both worried and excited. The king has commanded that we march to Delphi for a great council. Mess messengers have summoned all the people, and we leave before dark. Euros explained that the people had already started to pack, and as Orfeo neared camp, he could see that many of the tents had already disappeared into great bundles of dark goat hair cloth. All of the animals from the hills were being assembled together, and many had already been laden with things that needed to be carried. Orfeo arrived at the tent of Euros just before others removed the stakes, and he managed to bundle his few possessions into his winter cloak, and then to bind everything together with a leather thong. He seemed oddly comforting at moving time to have fewer possessions than anyone else, yet there was something humiliating in being a king's son who could carry his entire household in one pack. Orfeo had taken part in a number of moves since his return from Pelos, but the experience always seemed both exciting and confusing, and he felt himself no natural part of it. Everyone else seemed to know exactly what to do, and they went about their tasks as if all had been rehearsed, with roles assigned even to the children. If someone were to tell him to do something, he always responded with no hesitation, but he had no ways of anticipating the needs. Perhaps he could be described as helpless in the midst of an activity everyone else had naturally understood. Although it was not clear that everyone else noticed, they all seemed too busy with duties of their own. The horsemen had already come to formation before the tent of Kiros, 
and they were now awaiting his appearance before they could begin the march. Apparently, there was a sense of urgency or need for haste, but few in the camp had any idea as to what had occupied the councils. Shouts resounded among the men as they finally were directed to set off at a slow gallop. The rest of the tribe would follow, although now it was said that Kiros would ride ahead to meet Telamon at Delphi. The legendary Telamon had been summoned from the northern marches, and he would lend his mighty sword and men-at-arms to any move Kiros might make to recover Heron. Telamon, the great warrior, had led another part of the people in the north these many years, holding the Dorai at bay and securing the people of the south and their herds from the incursions of raiders. Orfeo had never seen Telamon, but there was word of him from all the others. His cousins had told of, of Telamon slaying a hundred Dorai warriors in one day, and once he had killed a lion with only a hunting knife. Telamon was described as a giant and a man apart from the others, a man of magical powers and fathomless strength. Rumor maintained that Zeus was his father when he had roamed the earth as a bull, and few expected Tele Telamon to die as a mortal man. The horse of Telamon was fabled in its own right, as he was the long, gleaming sword that some said was a gift of, of Mars and could never be broken. Telamon had been the champion of the people in their time of need, and it was said that if Telamon had been present in the bleak days of the invasion from Pelos, the humiliation would never have occurred, and his son would never have been taken as a hostage. When the champion arrived from his northern outpost several days later, there were reported to be bitter words from the tent of the king, but it was all the speculation of the camp's gossips. No one knew what had happened, and few knew Telamon by more than reputation. That was without peer, that, that he was without peer as a fighter, no one doubted. But as to the rest, he had spent little time among them. By now, more of the people had set, set out on their horses. Can we stop right here? Because... Uh, <coughs>